a kind of research area in um, formal or more formal theory, which goes under the name of this um, conformal collider physics um, shown here. I'll explain exactly what that is uh, in a moment. Uh, with real world uh, QCD, in particular at the LHC. Um, and so this has become a bit more. So let's move my mouse. Um, this has become a bit more exciting recently because there's actually been a number of measurements in the last couple of months of these observables that were inspired by this conformal collider uh, program. And so the hope here is I'm not going to go into too much detail on either the formal or the experimental side. I can try to give a broad overview of kind of what motivated this um, and how it provides a kind of different way of thinking about collider physics. Um, and then I'll show some of the actual um, experimental data at the LHC. And so I should just say, so this is maybe a bit outside of the um, main research interests of many of the people here. So particularly if you have questions about anything, feel free to interact or interrupt me during the talk. Okay. So the standard way that people analyze collider physics um, experiments is using jets, which are these sprays of particles that kind of come out of these particular collimated uh, things in particular directions. And so you can cluster them um, into these jets, and these jets have a kind of energy and a direction. And so the reason why this was historically important as a way of analyzing um, collider events is that these provide you the kind of kinematics of these jets, provide you access to the kinematics of the quarks and gluons of the underlying microscopic description. And so they allow you to kind of study scattering amplitudes in your theory of interest. Um, and so to be able to obtain a precise description of these jet cross sections um, at the LHC, particularly for these very complicated processes, has been a huge driver of theory developments um, in pure quantum field theory, particularly the amplitudes program, for the last uh, maybe 20 or 30 years. And so this has been extremely successful. So you can now compute, it's a bit hard to see what exactly these are, but processes with six or seven jets, which really test the nonlinear interaction of QCD in a very um, interesting way. And so this enables both precision tests of the standard model. And also if you understand these um, very well, it allows you to perform searches for new physics. And so this is, in my opinion, been a kind of very nice example of kind of experimental data driving theoretical uh, developments and how to think about quantum field theory and in return getting a kind of really improved description of um, experiments. Um, but if we look at one of these events, um, just from a either data analysis perspective or from a quantum field theory perspective, there's a huge amount more information in these beyond just the kind of kinematics and directions of these jets. And so if you take one of these jets, so for example, this one um, here with this nice little experimentalist looking at it, you see that inside it has a very complicated structure of the kind of energy flux hitting your detector. And so instead of just looking at the energy and the direction of this jet, you can look at, for example, statistical properties of how energy is distributed inside that jet. So in this case, it's measuring a three-point um, correlation function. And so you can really think of this kind of in analogy with the cosmic microwave factor. And so what these allow you to access is a very different set of questions than the kind of kinematics of these jets. So the kinematics of the jets allow you to access the underlying scattering amplitude, which kind of um, happens down here. But what these allow you to um, access is kind of how these particles interact and kind of fragment and ultimately hadronize into the detectors that, or into the detector where they are observed by the experimentalist. Um, and so this is something which goes under the name of jet substructure. Um, and it was really um, originally motivated about 15 years ago now, as a means, kind of it had very phenomenological origins, as a means of trying to develop new ways to search for particles at the LHC. So for example, if you produce some new particle, or in this case, a Higgs, if it decays purely hydronically, then as an experimentalist, the only way you can identify it is through a modification of the energy pattern which comes in your detector. Um, and so this kind of approach of looking at the energy patterns um, and really trying to understand how different microscopic signatures imprint themselves into the asymptotic energy flux kind of was rejuvenated and has been extremely successful as a means of kind of having new ways to search for new physics at the LHC, as well as, for example, for uh, discovering or searching for Higgs to BB or Higgs to charm charm, um, etc. Um, but this also had the kind of big impact of just reinvigorating the study of jets in QCD as a topic in their own right. Um, so even if you're not interested in looking, for example, for standard model uh, or beyond standard model physics, there's a huge amount of very interesting standard model physics, in particular QCD physics, which is imprinted into this collider flux. So for example, if you want to understand the quark gluon plasma or the kind of phase structure of QCD, this is imprinted in some way into the energy flux in these very complicated um, heavy ion collisions, uh, such as this one uh, shown here. 
Or similarly, if you want to understand the mechanism of confinement, so ultimately these quarks and gluons, which are produced in the underlying scattering amplitude, come out into hadrons in your detector, and there's some imprint of this, or the, of the mechanism of the confinement uh, process, which is imprinted in the asymptotic energy flux. And these are much more um, subtle signals. And so if you want to be able to, for example, look at this extremely complicated event and understand something about the microscopic properties of the corporal plasma, you really need to understand in detail how to extract signals um, from the asymptotic energy flux about the underlying microscopic uh, theory. And so it's kind of nice to think about this in analogy with cosmology. So what you want to do is to infer the kind of microscopic or early time physics from the asymptotic or late time energy flux. And in particular, you really want to be able to um, kind of make a mapping between what you can measure experimentally, so physical observables you can uh, measure experimentally, and kind of parameters of the underlying microscopic theory. So for example, the Lagrangian, or if it's some strongly coupled theory, some kind of properties of this theory. And so to be able to do this in either of these cases really requires kind of developing field theory techniques to interpret subtle correlations in these asymptotic fluxes in terms of the dynamics of the underlying um, theory. Um, and so with that is the motivation. What I'm going to try and do in this talk is so I'll first give an overview of some recent kind of theory developments in how you talk about energy flux or kind of asymptotic fluxes in colliders and how you can think about trying to kind of decode this in terms of the microscopic dynamics of the underlying theory. Um, then I'll apply this to the kind of simple case of very high energy quarks and gluons, which you can produce at the LHC and where we can perform uh, perturbative calculations and really understand things um, in quite some detail. And I'll be able to show kind of real data where you can actually verify some of the um, predictions coming from these more formal um, thinking in this section. Um, and then depending on the amount of time, I'll try and then apply this in some more complicated scenarios, for example, in the quark world plasma, where you don't really understand what's going on, but we have these very well calibrated probes and we can learn this to use about, or learn these to well, use these to learn about some kind of murkier systems um, and probe these more complicated uh, pieces. Okay, so the first thing we want to learn how to do is to talk about how to decode energy flux or just how to talk about fluxes in general um, in a kind of more abstract quantum field theory uh, language. And so it may be a little bit surprising, but if you think about it, often when you're doing collider physics, you don't really think about exactly what you're actually measuring. So if you're doing con condensed matter physics or cosmology, you know that the way you typically talk about the system is using uh, correlation functions. And so, for example, if you look at Haskin and Schroeder, when you do QFT, you learn how to calculate correlation functions of local operators, for example, fixed on some fixed time slots. And so that's also how you probe, for example, condensed matter systems in the lab and really just kind of measure correlation functions. And so the reason correlation functions are nice, so for example, a two-point correlation function like this, is it introduces a scale into the problem, which is either the distance or the angle between the two um, points, so the angle if it's on the... Um, CMB or kind of distance that is on your tabletop experiment. And so then what this two-point function is really doing is probing the dynamics as a function of the scale. So when you plot it as a function of scale, you know that the kind of the peaks here are associated with particular physical processes corresponding to that particular scale. So it kind of gives you a ruler um, which allows you to probe the system in a particular way. And so what we'd like to do is to understand if we can achieve a kind of similarly coherent picture for what we're asking in collider physics um, experiments. Um, and so to do this, we actually need to kind of take a step back and ask from a kind of pure field theory perspective, what exactly is a detector? So if you're a kind of formal theorist, this is a very complicated object. And so what you want to do is to make the kind of simplest toy model where you can ask some question which is analogous um, to what you're actually measuring in an LHC experiment. So if you have your kind of friend who studies conformal field theory or something, you want to be able to give them some kind of formal definition of an object which they can compute and study using their formal properties, which is in some way the simplest model of a collider experiment. Um, and so this is a kind of nice illustration by some of uh, my formal collaborators on what they think of the LHC as being. Um, and so what you're kind of doing is you're hitting um, your sample, which in our case is like the QCD or the standard model vacuum with some hammer. And so you learn how to expand that hammer over local operators. So this is not quite true of the LHC, but in E plus E minus or something, this is really a, a true statement that you expand your um, hammer over a set of local operators. And then you have a set of cameras, which you can kind of measure different fluxes which are coming out to infinity. So for example, a calorimeter cell is just a, a camera that measures um, energy coming out. 
And so what you'd like to do is to understand how to write down a kind of operator in quantum field theory, which represents that camera. Or if you have like a real detector, how you can expand it over a set of different cameras. And so here I'll mostly focus on energy flux, but you can do this for charge fluxes or whatever other um, fluxes you want. And so this is something which, although it seems like a very simple question, um, is actually kind of something which is at the kind of forefront of quite formal research is studying the kind of space of these camera operators in a particular um, field. And so in particular, if we want to write down a kind of the simplest version of uh, a collider experiment, we need to learn how to deal with these um, camera operators. And in particular, we need to understand what a detector operator is in quantum field theory. Um, and so the interesting thing, so this is something which was known in some sense a while ago, but then was really rejuvenated um, by Hoffman and Malvasina in about 2010, and has since attracted um, a lot of interest, is how to write down these camera operators. Um, and so the way that one should think of these is literally as a kind of theoretical idealization of a calorimeter cell in this sense for energy flux going in some particular direction on the celestial sphere or on the, on the sphere of infinity. Um, and so it turns out that you can write down such an operator which measures the energy of a particle which is coming out um, in this particular form, which is shown here. So it involves obviously the stress tensor and it's dotted into some particular direction. And then what you do is you integrate this over all time because that's because you're kind of imagining the LHC is just running and you're kind of having fluxes going off to infinity. And then you move this object off to um, infinity because compared to the QFT or compared to the scale of QCD or standard model interactions, the detector is essentially at infinity. Um, and so you can check, for example, if you do this in a free theory and just write this in terms of creation and annihilation operators, this object just returns for a free particle state the energy if it's going in that particular direction um, n. And so it really behaves as a calorimeter cell. And you can show this more generally in a generic um, quantum field. And so you can either, depending if you have a kind of particle physics view, you can do this as a kind of point um, in a detector. But it's nicer to think about it in this kind of Penrose diagram where you really emphasize this is a non local operator because it's integrated along a line. So it's kind of a, an operator that you've smeared it along um, a null array at infinity um, and in particular direction. And so then what you're measuring, if you're a kind of formal theorist, what people in just substructure are trying to measure are correlation functions of several of these calorimeter cells. So for example, a three-point uh, function in some particular state produced at the LHC. Um, and so the nice thing about this is that this is now an object which you can study in a completely abstract um, field theory. Um, and it's, so it's related to what you can actually measure, but you can tell your um, formal field theorist friends to just compute this or to study this using whatever techniques um, they have available. And so it allows you to kind of abstract what you're doing in quantum physics to a very simple um, toy problem. Okay. And so just to kind of emphasize again, these are kind of an interesting intermediate object between amplitudes, which are what you, um, on the one hand, typically study in quantum physics, um, and correlation functions. So if you come from more from the condensed matter side, you typically study correlation functions of local operators. And so these are very nice because they're um, IR finite or not perturbatively well defined, but they're not very nice because they don't have asymptotic states. So these are not useful, for example, for collider um, experiments. On the other hand, amplitudes are very nice because they involve these states coming off uh, to infinity, but they're not IR finite. And so you have to, for example, use these JET um, algorithms or do something um, special to specify. And so the nice thing about these energy correlators is that they kind of lie in this um, in-between range. They're kind of half a correlation function and half an amplitude. Um, and they can be directly physically measured um, in an experiment. And so this kind of puts them in a kind of interesting position where you can apply um, techniques from both the amplitudes world and the correlation functions world um, to study them. But despite this kind of physical importance, in particular, they can be actually measured. They were much less explored until about the last kind of five years or so. Um, and so this is a very nice theory thing. You can play with these and they have very nice properties. Um, and so what I want to talk about mostly in the rest of this talk is can this theoretical idealization actually work in this messy world of kind of real um, hadron colliders? Um, and even more than its work, can it actually provide new ways of kind of understanding or analyzing data in these very um, complex collisions? Um, so my hope, obviously, uh, or I would not be giving this talk, is to convince you that this is a kind of, or provides some interesting new ways of looking at these collisions, and in particular, extracting kind of universal or very simple properties of the underlying field theory from these very complicated um, events.
And so from as you now move to the actual kind of real world, so this is an actual measurement. And I'll spend a lot of the talk um, going through what this actually means. So this is a measurement which came out about a month ago of this two-point um, energy correlator. So it's measured as a function of the angle now between um, the two detectors, which I'll call RL. Um, and so this is um, RL down here. Getting So as you move this way, the kind of um, angle between the two correlators um, gets smaller. And so you can see that it has this very interesting shape. So on this side, you have a, so this looks almost like a kind of phase transition plot. So on this side, what you have is a scaling, which can be computed in terms of uh, perturbative quarks and gluons. And so in particular, this will have a non-integer scaling behavior, which is kind of like um, in critical behavior, where you compute this anomalous dimension for this scaling in terms of the underlying uh, quarks and gluons. And it will have non-trivial higher point correlations, so three and four point um, correlations, because these quarks and gluons are kind of interacting um, field here. Then at some point, what happens is you hit the confinement scale. And so again, because you have this kind of ruler, you would just kind of see the dynamics of the function of scale. So eventually you see that there's a confinement transition where these quarks and gluons um, transform into hadrons. And so once they're in their hadronic phase, you see a very different uh, scaling behavior on this side, which is just an integer power ball scaling. So it's just geometric. So you get the same thing if you had like billiard balls that are just uniformly distributed. And so this is really saying that these are non-interacting hadrons coming out of your detector, as you would expect. And you'll have all trivial higher point um, correlation points. And so by thinking in this um, energy correlator uh, perspective, and I'll explain in quite some detail how you get both of these um, in a second, you really can kind of take real world uh, dynamics of these very complicated real world collisions, these very complicated collider experiments, and get out this kind of very simple behavior where you can really see the kind of properties um, and quantify properties um, associated with asymptotic freedom and this confinement transition um, in one point. Um, so what I'll do in the rest of the talk is to kind of understand quantitatively what's happening um, in these different regions, and then apply this to some different um, systems. Were there any questions before I go on? I will then have to set up. Yeah. Why are the people Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's a very good. So I'll skip ahead for a second. So. This is a very interesting uh, historical question, but why this was, and so it's so for, from my perspective, this advocates strongly the position that I want to take in this talk. So in some sense, and I'll describe in detail what these um, scalings are in a second, but in some sense, this is like the most basic question you could have asked about a collider um, experiment. And so the, the obvious question is why why did people not do this um, before? And so there's this very nice, so when Hoffman and Alcina published this paper, there's this very nice, and this is verbatim from the YouTube presentation at KFP, where Polchinski was at, he kind of described this particular scaling, which I'll discuss in a second. And Polchinski was kind of saying, well, there's a huge amount of PCB data. Why don't people do this? And then his response was um, that people have not really um, thought about it, um, and they just don't do it this way. Um, and so this is very nice for my position. Um, um, and it was true until actually um, a kind of year or two ago, um, but it's not quite true. So people in the late 70s proposed using this type of thing, um, in particular, um, Steve Ellis. Um, and so there were two problems at that time. So one problem was that to see this kind of interesting, I'll describe why this behavior is particularly interesting, but this is an extremely small angle. And so in the early, if you look at like the left data, the bin that they have is like the entire plot shown here. So this is like one bin. And so you just couldn't, so on the one hand, you just couldn't see this behavior. And second of all, this kind of inspiration from conformal field theory works very well when you have a very high multiplicity of particles. And in the jets of lab, you have like four particles. And so if you're trying to measure like a four point correlation function and you have four particles, it's just dominated by kind of a non perturbative effect. So the fact that you really have masses in your problem. And then when you go to the LHC, you have like 100 particles in your jet, you can really start to talk in a, in a meaningful way about the statistical problem. Um, but I've talked a lot to this, um, Steve, and he kind of, but this is what they really kind of wanted to do, is just that, first of all, they could not do perturbative calculations at that point, and so you couldn't calculate these. So there's been a huge development in calculational techniques, so you can actually do these things now, and they didn't have um, experimental data. But now you have both the LHC and a kind of wealth of perturbative um, data, so you can actually start to, to work with these. But it's a very interesting, and in this, um, so Malacena 
um, when he came out with this in 2009, I mean, he talked to, he told me he talked to a lot of people, um, tried to get them to do it. Um, but his view or the way he talks about biophilia is very formal. And I think there was just some like language barrier and it just did not work out. Um, but yeah, he understood very clearly at that time why he wanted to do this. Um, but there was, so there's been a number of kind of misfirings. Um, and it should have been done much earlier. And so it's, it's an interesting sort of role. That's a very, yeah, good question. Okay. Okay. So you, if you want to, when you talk about the entire Yes. Yeah. Yes. yeah. You can be to input that structure. Definitely. So you can do that, but still, I'll try to, in this section, I'll describe why at small angles, what you get is a very nice universal behavior. So if you do it at larger angles, then it depends on the kind of properties, for example, of the initial stage and the fact that you have protons that are going to be different than you plus or minus. And the way or how you interpret it is very hard. Like you can calculate it, but it doesn't have a clean interpretation. And the, the thing that will be very nice is that at, at small angles within a jet, there'll be a very clean interpretation of what you're seeing. Um, and so that's what I'll, I'll describe here. And then hopefully that'll make sense. And what you can definitely ask you about that. Okay. Okay. So the first thing we want to use with this picture is to kind of relate it to your question to see if you can use this to identify some universal features of um, QCD or generically of any um, filter. Um, the kind of motivation for this, or the way that one should think about this, is if you have a Euclidean field theory, or in general, if, or if you're probably a field theory in the Euclidean regime, what you have is this operator product expansion of uh, Wilson, which says that if you take two local operators and bring them together, you can expand them over a local set of operators. So this is like this hammer picture, uh, which I showed before. So you can take a generic operator or product of operators and expand them over some set of local operators. Uh, and so the nice thing about this and what it predicts is some scaling behavior as a function of certain anomalous dimensions in your theory as you bring these operators together. Um, and so this is very nice because if you have some, or this describes, for example, critical phenomena. So if you have some very macroscopic system, for example, of helium, if you, it may look kind of very messy, but if you look at specific properties, for example, these heat capacities near phase transitions, what you're actually getting from the scaling behavior is access to certain microscopic and almost dimensions of the underlying sphere. Um, so it allows you to probe with macroscopic experiments, kind of microscopic parameters that you really understand. So if you know this operator, then you really know what you're probing um, in your underlying sphere. In general, things are much less understood once you go into this kind of Lorentzian um, signature. Uh, but it turns out that there's actually, or as was originally conjectured by um, Hoffman and Alcina, that you actually have an operator product expansion for these calorimeter cells. So you can think of this as a kind of operator product expansion for cameras. So if you have two things which can kind of detect, you can expand them over a more general detector. And so this, I will not go through in too much detail. I'll show a particular example of what these detectors are in a second. But the point is that they don't have to be something which an experimentalist can actually build. It's just a kind of more generalized detector, but it predicts a scaling behavior as you bring these uh, correlators together, with, which is now a scaling behavior as a function of theta, um, which depends on certain anomalous dimensions of these operators in the underlying sphere. And so if you believe this, and I'll show in a second, uh, I'll explain this in a little bit more detail in a second, what it allows you to do is it allows you to predict certain universal scaling behavior in correlations of your energy flux, at high energies, which just come from this formula and knowing the kind of spectrum of these operators in your theory. So you don't kind of need to do perform perturbative calculations as you typically would think of in QCD. You just need to understand the spectrum of these operators in your theory and the um, associated anomalous dimensions. And so this is why this is something that the formal community um, really likes because you can talk about, for example, jets in strongly coupled theories or in any theory of your particular liking. Because um, this is kind of more, or this is a, essentially some abstraction of what you're trying to do in real world um, collider. Um, and so I've already shown this one, but so this was this um, prediction, which Malacina uh, made about 10 years ago. And the reason why this is that non-trivial, as I said, is these are no longer local operators, but these are these um, line operators of the Lorentzian signature. And he kind of advocated for this, but then it was glossed over, as I said. Um, and so what one needs to do if one wants to apply this at the LHC is to understand what are the specific space of these operators or these detectors which can appear um, in QCD. So in conformal field theories, this operator product expansion can actually be shown to be convergent and you can under construct the operators that are shown here. 
And if you want to do this to actually make predictions for the LHC, we just need to understand what type of cameras can appear um, in QC. And so I won't go into too much um, technical detail because it's actually not that um, complicated or relevant. But so in QCD, if you only want to look for this kind of leading spin behavior, it turns out what you need are so-called twist two um, spin J operators. So these are, for example, the local versions of these operators are what, are, what can be found, for example, in Peskin and Schroeder. And so you can, the way you should think about this is if I want to detect a generic state, I just need to have some detectors which can detect, for example, forks, and some which can detect rules, so that I can make from those more um, generic counts. And so these are the local operators. And then similar to the stress tensor, which I talked about uh, before, what you do is you take these local operators, which you can find in Peskin, and you just integrate them along uh, infinity, just like you did for the uh, energy momentum tensor. And this provides you some more generic set of operators, which can detect essentially either quarks or gluons. And the spin should be thought of as some form of uh, energy wave. Again, the exact details don't really matter uh, for now. And so the claim is that these are the only objects which appear in the um, right, -hand, right hand side of this equation. And so if you buy this, then what it means is that the anomalous dimensions of these particular operators shown here will determine the leading behavior of all these um, endpoint correlation functions in jet substructure. And so in particular, if you probe correlations in the energy flux um, in colliders, what you're sensitive to are the spectrum of these particular anomalous dimensions of these twist to uh, light ray operators. And so I'll kind of skip, so you have to do a few extra steps to actually embed this in the real world LHC, which I'll just skip. Um, and so if you actually go in and measure this, so this is, was done using some open data, so you can actually just go and take some CMS data and analyze it yourself. Um, and so if you do this, you can measure this two-point um, correlation function. So this is uh, plotted here, shown again as a function of this angular separation between the two uh, detectors. And what you see is, again, this beautiful uh, power law scaling like this, just like you do for um, critical phenomena. And so in particular, this kind of verifies this particular um, operator product expansion shown here. And so the thing which I think, or at least for me, is particularly appealing is these collider events are extremely complicated. And so if you ask questions, for example, about interjet correlations, what you get out of something very complicated, which is a property of the state. Um, so this is a uniform or a universal prediction of the scaling behavior at very small angles. And so you can really measure this in very complicated um, LHC collisions and really get access to these anomalous dimensions. So what you're kind of getting out is universal properties of the underlying field theory, as opposed to properties that depend on the overall state. Um, so it provides you kind of access to these in a very clean way, and, and it provides a direct link between kind of experimental observables and anomalous dimensions of the underlying uh, field theory. So you can really map between what you're measuring experimentally and the microscopic um, theory. Um, and so this is something that's now being measured over a huge wide range of energies. It's actually all the way from 15 GeV to 2 TeV by a variety of different um, experiments here. And so you can see all these nice, particularly extremely high energies where you have uh, purely perturbative physics. You see these very nice um, scaling behaviors over a very wide range of energies where perturbative um, QCD applies. Um, and so one thing which you should kind of ask is in this um, expression, you have both the kind of anomalous dimension um, shown here, and then you have a kind of classical part. And so we're going to ask, can you really probe the actual kind of anomalous or quantum scaling? Um, and so of course, in this plot as shown here, what you're sensitive to is mostly the um, classical power law um, scaling behavior of the, or the kind of classical dimension of this operator. And so it turns out you can actually do something much more interesting which is a kind of prediction of this light ray operator product expansion, that it predicts that if you take generic endpoint functions, so you can take, for example, a three or four point function, which would be very hard to compute in perturbative PCB, or if you take it sufficiently large, it's impossible. It turns out that you can actually predict the scaling as a function of n. So for example, if you take this three point correlator and scale it as a function of size, this predicts that it scales with the anomalous dimension of a twist to if this is three, spin four operator. So it's associated with a particular operator in your theory. And so by taking the ratio of these higher point correlators to the two point correlator, you cancel the classical piece and are uh, um, sensitive solely to the difference of the, or the anomalous dimensions of these two different operators. And so over here is again, using this open data, ratios of the six point over the two point, five point, four point, three point, um, et cetera. 
And so you can see that, first of all, these are non, so these will be flat, if it was a kind of classical and non interacting theory. And so their slopes are purely proportional to the enormous dimensions of these operators. And so by looking at this asymptotic energy flux, you can kind of probe the spectrum of the operators which are forming on your jet. So you can kind of see their different um, anomalous dimensions um, shown here. And so, for example, for people that have studied these things, there are certain properties. So, for example, the fact that the slope gets steeper as you probe higher and higher point correlation functions is some monotonicity of the register trajectory um, increasing. And so these things are understood, um, the kind of formal properties are understood quite some detail. And you can really measure these even in these very complicated um, LHC fields. And so it provides kind of a very different way of looking at um, LHC data. Um, and so this was recently, uh, this, uh, this last month, done by, again, this, this particular ratio was measured by um, CMS at extremely high energy. So again, up to 2 TeV. Um, and so you can really probe this difference of anomalous dimensions, which is shown um, right here. And so you see these very nice um, scaling laws, which are just governed by this uh, particular scale here, over a huge uh, range of energies. Um, and so you can ask, what can you do by observing these different scalings? Um, so the first thing, which is quite interesting, which is very different than a conformal field theory. So for example, if you did this with a conformal field theory, it would be the exact same slope for all energies. Um, and so here you can see that it changes a lot as you go from extremely high energies to lower energies, which is just um, a manifestation of asymptotic free. Um, so the first thing you can do is you can just, or you can extract the value, I'll, or I'll show properly how you extract the value of alpha s in a second, but you can just measure, for example, the slope as a function of the PT or the energy of these jets. And you see that it falls off um, very nicely, which is just a manifestation of asymptotic freedom kind of by I. And so you get this very nice scaling behavior, but now not in a conformal field theory, but in an actual um, not, not conformal theory with a, a beta function. So you really throw in some detail on um, the beta function, which is quite neat. So it's kind of like a phase transition with enormous dimensions that depend on the, on the scale. Um, so the next thing you can actually do is you can calculate these things quite precisely in perturbative QCD. And so because this um, scaling behavior is directly proportional to the value of the coupling, so just like how you measure in a phase transition, you can measure the critical exponents of the IC model. Here you can actually measure the value of the strong coupling constant um, at the LHC. And so CMS did this um, extraction where they got this particular value of alpha S or the coupling in QCD. And so the exact value doesn't matter. But the interesting thing is that this is at the level of about 4%. So this is starting to get competitive with other extractions, which are done historically using E plus E minus um, data. And so E plus E minus data is extremely um, clean. So this is why this was um, studied or you had much better um, theoretical control. But because it was done at much lower energies, it's very difficult to deal with um, non perturbative aspects. And you had old um, detectors. And so it's been very difficult to do this at the LHC because it's extremely messy. Um, and by using this kind of universal scaling behavior, you can actually get, so this is the, in this little red band, is the value of alpha s that they extracted along with this uncertainty. And you can see that it's kind of starting to get competitive with extractions from E plus E minus. Um, but the very, and so it's, it's just kind of a proof of principle. So it can definitely be improved significantly, but it's a proof of principle that you can really extract the coupling in the very complicated LHC environment by looking at um, these kind of universal um, scaling mechanisms. Um, so the hope is that this can be done significantly better. Um, yeah. So with the hope of uh, uh, energy less amplifiers, help with the theoretical uncertainty of such a Absolutely, yeah. The higher level of you can do this very, very much better. Yeah. Um, because you mean for muon versus electrons? No. Okay. Just the highest energy. Yeah. Because the thing is very or uh, non-trivial. So if I why didn't so the thing that's non-trivial, if you want to compute these in the LHC, so once you do this OPE, you get onto some of these light ray operators like this. And so it reduces to calculating the expectation value of some light ray in some state. But you still need to like prepare the state. And that's very complicated in the LHC. So you need like two to many gluon amplitudes. And so it's really the this one you know to like the scaling of this, you know, to very, very high loop order in QCD. And so it's really the preparation of the state, which is very complicated in the LHC. And so you go to E plus E minus, that drastically simplifies the calculation of the state. And so you can do this uh, much better. But, yeah. but for now, you know, this, so yes. Um, but no, that, that would be, that would be extremely nice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
Okay, so the next thing we're going to do is so the simplest property is always this kind of scaling behavior. But obviously, what you want to do is to actually be able to measure, for example, just like you do in the CMB, you want to be able to measure higher point um, correlation functions. So the lowest point is kind of identify a scale in some certain anomalous dimensions, but the higher point correlation functions really encode the kind of underlying um, interaction. And so this is something which has been done historically. There's been a huge amount of effort, again, starting from Navasina, um, from computing non-Gaussianities um, in the CMB. But you could ask, what is the structure of higher point correlations of um, energy flux? And surprisingly, this is something which has actually not um, been investigated um, in essentially any detail. So the only explicit results for this were in the original Hoffman and Navasina paper, where they were able to write down the generic form of these correlators for a generic endpoint correlation function but as an expansion of a strong coupling in ads -CFT. Um, So you'll notice that the first term here is one. So this is if you have like a uniform strongly coupled mush. Um, and then you have corrections and one over the coupling, uh, which you can treat. And so this is something which is very different. So this is not what you have in, for example, a high energy perturbative QCD, where you have kind of perturbative force and um, And so apart from this, there was almost no um, available calculations of these higher point correlation functions um, in the literature. But the kind of nice thing is that now that you have this huge availability of um, techniques that have been developed to calculate perturbative scattering amplitudes, you can apply these to compute these correlation functions um, at the coupling. And so the kind of neat thing is that these behave almost like amplitudes because once you have, for example, a three point correlation function, it has some kind of kinematics associated with that shape. So you compute the correlation function as a function of the shape, for example, of this um, triangle. Um, shown here, so it's a triangle with a three point correlation and some more generic shape for higher point. Um, so you can really compute the um, correlation function as a function of the shape. And this is really, unlike an amplitude, it's a kind of direct observable which you can measure on your um, detector. So you can compute some interesting function and you can really kind of measure this um, in quite some detail. And so over time, I'll just skip a little bit how one actually got this. Um, but I'll just show kind of the type or the flavor of what you get. In, for example, this n equals four super yang mills, which is just a kind of simplified version of QCD. And then once you have it in n equals four, you can do it again in QCD. It just requires a little extra um, effort. And so the kind of nice thing is you get out, depending on your taste, a very compact um, result for the shape of this correlation function, which depends on certain um, logarithmic function. And so these are things that are very familiar in the amplitudes world. And so from the amplitudes perspective, this is actually a relatively simple um, calculation. It's just that these techniques have not um, been applied here. But the very neat thing about this is that this is an actual prediction for the kind of shape of the correlation functions on your detector. And so you can really just plot this and then compare it with the measurement. So this is very different than amplitudes where you have to kind of square and do all this um, stuff and their underlying kind of unity is destroyed. So this you can really just measure the shape on your um, detector. And so if you go out and do this, so this becomes very hard to visualize because it's not a shape of a triangle. So this is, you can fix the overall size, and then you have two parameters which parameterize the kind of shape of the triangle. So if you've looked at plots of non-Gaussianities in the CMB, it's kind of similar. But so loosely speaking, there's kind of an equilateral triangle up here. There's this thing called a flattened triangle down here where you kind of shrunk it down in the middle. And then over here, it's where the one side is very small, and this is kind of the angle. And then this is loosely speaking, the length of this, this side here. It's a bit hard to um, visualize. Um, but then the kind of neat thing is you can really measure this non-Gaussianity, which is shown over here. And then this is the kind of theory prediction. So you can really get under control these um, multi-point correlation functions um, in QCD. And really kind of test that you understand the nonlinear interactions of QCD and compare them uh, with data. Okay, so now that you have this under control, so in some sense, this is just perturbative QCD, and we better been able to just compute it and compare it. So there was no, it's more just a test of our understanding. And so now what we want to do is to use these um, in more complicated systems where we don't understand all the dynamics. And then from how they're modified, we can extract some properties of the underlying dynamics. Um, and so the kind of upshot of the first part of the talk is that you have this very nice and simple scaling behavior, which I showed. And so now kind of any scale which you put into your problem, you can kind of extract that scale. So for example, if you put I'll discuss like a top quark or this quark along plasma, you should be able to kind of see the scale of this new object imprinted into the correlators in some particular um, way. And so I'll just go through quickly. I think I have about 10 minutes, yeah, five minutes. I'll just go through very quickly kind of three examples and I won't go into too much detail. You can ask after if you have more questions. 
I'll, kind of, I'll even put in some additional scale and kind of really um, use this to learn something about the underlying uh, process. So we'll do first the confinement transition, which I already showed earlier in this plot, then how you can use this to kind of weigh the top four, um, and then how you can look at the kind of scales of the core we want. Uh, okay, so the confinement transition. So one thing which one would like to understand better is the actual dynamics of the hadronization process. So in a lattice, you can compute, for example, the spectrum of hadron. But one thing which you have access to in a Clyder experiment is the kind of real-time dynamics of the confinement transition from forcing gluons into um, hadrons. And so we would like to be able to um, understand something about this kind of rearrangement of degrees of freedom. And so as I said before, so now hopefully this plot will make uh, more sense. So what I've shown before, or the kind of previous section of the talk, is how to compute in perturbation theory in quite some detail this side. So then in perturbation theory, you just lose control. And on this side, you have some completely different behavior. And so what this really allows you to do is to image, in some sense, the confinement transition. And so there's currently no known way to compute in this middle region where you're kind of really rearranging um, the degrees of freedom. But you can actually now measure this in quite some detail. You can measure it on different, for example, different baryonic states. And hopefully from those measurements, you can extract some information or ultimately some better understanding of the um, confinement transition. So at least, even though you can't understand it theoretically, it provides you some experimental insight into the um, confinement um, problem. And so, as I mentioned earlier, this is really um, coming from the fact that we now have these exceptional detectors, and so you can measure things at extremely small resolution to be able to actually um, see this dynamics. Okay. So the next thing you can do with this is something which you can use this three-point correlation function, which I showed, but to now compute it in some more complicated state where you have a top four. And so now this is something, the way that one will do this is very similar to, again, if you've seen these pictures of cosmology. So if you have some kind of higher derivative or local operator, it primarily imprints itself in the equilateral structure. So you can now imagine this is like some top four, which decays into three uh, particles primarily. And so you expect that you'll have some kind of imprint in an equilateral regime at a scale of essentially the angle set by the top fourth mass over the PT. And then similarly, you'll have some uh, regime in this squeezed region where two of them are close together, where the kind of intermediate W is on shell. And so you'll get some sensitivity. Um, this is similar, again, if one is more familiar with the cosmology sense, some kind of light, lighter um, species. And you'll get some um, imprint of the scale of this at the in TCD, the scale of the W over the PT. And so the very nice thing about this is that in the LHC environment, you don't know the PT of the jets that accurately, but if by kind of studying, if you essentially take the ratio of these two, the PT will cancel and you'll be able to extract the value of the top mass in units of the W. And so by looking at the full shape of these three point correlators, the hope is that you can extract very precisely the mass of the top fork. Um, and so surprisingly, even though the top fork is one of the kind of most important parameters of the standard model, it's actually very hard to understand how to extract it theoretically because, because it interacts strongly. You need to do this in a kind of theoretically well-defined setup. Um, and so most measurements, they kind of break this um, theoretical lightness. And so what you really need are kind of very simple observables which tall mass with tall mass sensitivity that you can compute with from first principle. And so these three point correlators are kind of the simplest possible uh, observable that have this um, sensitivity. Um, and so this is a little bit um, complicated, but essentially what you can do, so this is a plot again of the shape of this three point correlator. And you can kind of see in it, there's a lot in this plot and I apologize, both the uh, value of the W projected onto this side and the top. And so this full three-point shape is essentially a mess, uh, but you can kind of project out and onto one um, side, which determines the scaling, and you can see kind of very clearly two bumps coming from these different regions which I described before, which give you sensitivity. So these kind of two peaks give you sensitivity in the W and the top mass. And you'll see that this kind of very sheep, steep scaling behavior here is what you get in this massless QCD, which I showed before. And then it's kind of going down the, at the scale where you see the W mass, it kind of imprints itself very clearly as these kind of peak structures. Um, and so the hope is we can use this for a kind of very precise um, and theoretically well understood measurement of the top fourth mass um, at the LHC. Um, and just one more uh, quick example before I conclude is to use this in to understand the dynamics of the quark gluon plasma. So if you try and produce this quark gluon plasma, um, at some collider, like this is at uh, Rick on Long Island, 
What you'd like to do is to, again, understand the microscopic dynamics. So, for example, some transport properties of this PGP from the um, asymptotic energy flux. And so this is something where you really need to understand in quite some detail the link between the external measurements and the parameters of the underlying theory because it is strongly coupled. Um, and so the kind of simplest thing you would like to be able to do is if you observe this very complicated spray of particles, how do you even tell there was, for example, a 10 to the minus 14 meter ball of plasma um, that was produced in the center? So you just like to be able to kind of image on um, that scale. Um, and so the way that this works is you can kind of, because you have this angular scale of the separation, essentially what is controlling is the lifetime of the intermediate particle that it propagates out and splits into your detector. And so if you're at very small angles, it means the lifetime is very long. And so the kind of splitting occurred very near to the detector. So this is kind of like an ABS CFT. If you're very, um, it's kind of this UV IR mixing, where if you're very small scales, it means it happened close to the boundary. And then as you move these back or apart on your detector, you kind of drive the interaction back into the plasma. And so at some scale, it will kind of enter the plasma. You should see an abrupt um, kind of change in the scaling behavior of your coil. And so this is shown here, where in vacuum, you get this very nice um, scaling behavior shown here. And as you move to increasing uh, values of this angle, you see this abrupt change at this particular value, where this kind of splitting enters the plasma. And so you can really detect there was this very small um, kind of femtometer scale uh, ball of plasma from the asymptotic energy flux. And then by measuring, for example, properties in this region or higher point correlation functions in this region, you're sensitive to, for example, transport coefficients in the plasma. And so you can really image from the asymptotic energy flux the kind of microscopic properties um, of this plasma. And so there's a kind of measure. So this is just a calculation, but there's a measurement of this which has been done and will be um, come up soon. And you can really start to um, understand kind of properties of strongly interacting finite temperature um, PCB. It's quite intense. I'll skip this. And so just to summarize, so one thing that's really happened over the past kind of five years is a lot of these insights from quite formal even string theory are starting to kind of transform the way that we think even how to ask questions in jet substructure. And the real kind of link of this, or so the reason why this works, is because you have this kind of physical realization, maybe just substructure of this operator product expansion limit of light rail operators, which provides this kind of direct bridge between kind of field theory developments um, and QCD phenomenology. Um, and this is really starting to be able to be applied in real world on collider experiments to allow kind of asymptotic energy flux to be decoded in terms of the underlying field theory and hopefully learn something interesting about QCD or beyond the static model physics. Um, so thank you and sorry for your time. Good. So you mean missing energy in the Yeah. So so I mean one thing you could try and do. So one thing which is a bit weird about these observables is they're really a statistical ensemble. So they're very different than standard like search searches. So normally you like cut on a single variable, which is defined like jet per jet. And so the unusual thing about this is because it's really a statistical ensemble, it's not defined at a jet by jet level, and you only build it up over time um, as a, um, a, a kind of statistical ensemble, which is why it's very good for like, if you're producing a bunch of top quarks or something, you could, like it's always the same top quark. But if you want to understand the, like unless you're looking for some process which has a kind of standard, or like always the same missing energy, it's gonna be very hard to find it because it's always averaging over it. Um, and so one thing which it could be like it can be used to kind of in that language is because these are sensitive to, for example, a mass ratio, like if you knew very well, so often you don't know very well the PT, for example, if you have missing energy, but if you know the W mass, then you can extract the PT kind of independently from this angle. But you always need to calibrate in some way. So you need some sort of processes where it's always the kind of same process happening. And so these are the things that you like you're really taking an ensemble average in some set of states, and so those states have to be the same. And that's what makes it nice from a theory perspective, whereas like event by event observables are like, so there you really need to know like from this perspective, the fluctuations of this quantity. So not just like the average, the expectation, but all the higher um, moments. And so that's why from a theoretical perspective, these are much easier than that question. Um, so, so for example, if I suppose, you know, some quantities, uh, reducing the 
Yeah. And they probably say. Then, then and, yeah. yeah. But in that case, can I distinguish the masses that are missing in the people? That I'm not so sure. It depends from just the simple, just the simple correlate because maybe there's something no. Uh, but maybe if you made it some more complicated correlators or something. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's very different. One thing is it's very different than how like searches are typically done, and it's in some sense more similar to like if you think about how searches are done in cosmology versus how they're done in uh, the LHC. So like in cosmology, you always do these like statistical ensembles, and you like. Look for like a template, whereas in LHC is almost always kind of cut and looking at, and so it's a very different uh, setup. This might still make some identifying the topological, but to get the honest one for Yeah, yeah, you could do that. Yeah, so you can make some selection, which then just means you're defining the state, right. and then you have to compute the state with those selections. So that's done like in these, for example, there's some like TT cut on the jets. So you're looking at some um, set of jets with some positive scattering. And that, that's what makes calculating this um, difficult. Yeah, yeah. And so that's where, like, in E plus and minus, you, this state is really produced by a local operator. So that's what makes it very much easier. So you, there you don't need to do any of that um, selection. Like more general questions you want to extract? Yeah, but what do you mean? Usually, get to the time of the interaction, or they did not able to do it. So, you mean like just generic questions you want to ask? Yeah, so I think this depends a little bit on the type of question. So, there's been a lot of effort on like machine learning for looking at jets. And so, there you just you don't care as much about having theory, theory control, and you just want to be able to look for some particular signal. And so that's where this, like at the very beginning, this, um, like this that substructure um, has really like um, evolved into a huge kind of field of just trying to look like if you produce whatever type of particle here, how to identify its signal. And so that's something where there's been a huge amount of work, um, like thousands and thousands of searches, and now it's been hugely influenced by machine learning of really like, whatever type of particle you put into here. You can understand how it imprints the scene. And so, I think from a modern perspective, this is now like machine learning driven. And so, whatever, like if you have some particular model, you would put it in. And then, since you have quite good modeling colors, you can train and understand how to extract it from the enemy blocks. Um, and so, where these are good, or where having a cleaner theory description is really good, is if you really want to extract a property of the field. So, if you just want to identify, like, is there a something like a Higgs or some like particular PSM particle, then it's just kind of like, a, is it there or not? And you don't need to understand the position details. If you really want to map it to like a field theory parameter, so like the value of the coupling or like mass or some like transport coefficient, that's where you really then want to like have a very simplified interval where you have a direct mapping between what you're measuring and what you're calculating. So I think it really depends on like what you want to get out of it. And so there's like a huge matter, of like a whole conference on machine learning for jets with like, uh, 500 people, and so it's, like, it's a huge field of just if I stick something in, how do I extract it out the other end? And, and that's so I, I'd say that's how like machine learning here. Another good thing, so how about the part of them? Yeah, in, inside of them, there are there can be much of the, the aspect of. Yeah, absolutely. So one thing which is very nice about these is that because they have this explicit energy weighting, so there's two things that you can do. Um, so first of all, these have an explicit weighting of the energy, and so the soft pileup is, is suppressed by this, and so that's why you're measuring like an energy and not like a number of correlator. So it's not, if you measure like a number, this would be extremely sensitive to pile up. Because of this, you're, if you're doing a very high energy depth, so it's like a TV and a pileup is much lower, that's uh, suppressing thing. And then you can also measure, so these can be computed on tracks, on the like charged particles, but it's kind of changing the definition of what's um, here. So it's just the stress tensor for charged particles. And this further reduces um, pile. 
Um, and so in these like calculations um, or these comparisons to data where things are precisely extracted, you didn't have to do like pile up. So for example, this there's been no pile of subtraction, no removal of stuff, and it works kind of very nicely, which is very different than like earlier observables where you have to do the cooling and all this removal, which complicates the theory description. Um, so this is really just exactly to do this and all the stuff, if you look at the small angle limit, is naturally suppressed. So if you go to like these interject correlations, then you have large effects in pile. But in the small angle limit, it's really just this universal property in pile. So that that is simplified the Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can see the other things. Yeah, what about the lower? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, then I can just do the OP of these, and it's just universal, it doesn't depend on the presence of this. So you can think of it as kind of producing the, the, like the state. And then I'm doing this two point OP in the presence of a more complicated state. Oh, if that makes sense. So they kind of, as long as these two are much closer together, than, like as long as this side is much smaller than this side, its dynamics are essentially, so like the full calculation, it, it needs to be there, but the actual scaling behavior is just dictated by the behavior of these two operators come to do. And so you kind of think of like bringing these OP and these two together is just a universal property of those two operators. But it only applies, like it's really an expansion when these, this side is much smaller than this side. Otherwise, you get some correctness to that. 